tonight's title is Awake, O Sleeper. You'll find this in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Awake, O Sleeper, and arise from the dead. Now what person, rashly, would grasp it? See, the Bible is addressed to the imagination, which is spiritual sensation, and only but immediately to the understanding or reason. If you try to grasp it through reason, well, it doesn't make sense. How could I speak to someone and tell him that he's not only asleep, but he's dead? I equate sleep with death and tell a man that I'm addressing to awake you sleeper and arise from the dead. I am telling him he has entered a world of eternal death, but he doesn't know it. I am telling him that he is dreaming his world into being, but he doesn't know it, and maybe he doesn't believe it, for he's a rational being. In the Old Testament, in the 44th chapter of the book of Psalms, we read, Rouse thyself. Why sleepest thou, O Lord? Awake. So it's addressed to the Lord. All the commands of Scripture are addressed to the Lord and fulfilled by the Lord. There is nothing but the Lord. So we start on the greatest confession of faith that man has ever received through revelation. It's called the Hebrews' Confession of Faith, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. It's a compound unity, one made up of others. For the word is Elohim, the gods. Now I will tell you, I firmly believe in God. I don't have to believe in God, for I stood in the presence of the risen Lord, who embraced me and incorporated me into his one body. And from that moment, back in 1929, I am one with the body of the risen Lord. So here is the Lord. I don't have to believe in it. But I will tell you, using the word belief, I believe in God. I believe also that men are gods and that collective man is God. That we are the gods spoken of in the 82nd Psalm, which we are told is the most difficult of all the Psalms for the scholars to unravel. If it ever had any meaning, they say, the meaning has long been lost. And this is what stumps me. It's quoted in the 10th chapter of the book of John. But we'll go back to the origin, the 82nd Psalm. And God has taken his place in the divine assembly. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Now he speaks. I say ye are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, now here comes a future prophecy now. All this is a present fact. Ye are gods, now. Sons of the Most High, now. Nevertheless, ye shall die as men and fall as one man. O ye princes, here is a prophecy. You'll fall as one man. Is the fall the result of disobedience, as we are taught? Is the fall something that is a punishment? I tell you, it is not. The fall is a plan. It's a pretext. An assumed appearance in order to conceal the real intention. The real intention is an expansion. 
of further existence, an ultimate birth. That's the real intention. And the gods fell as one man. One man. He chose us in himself before the foundation of the world. And as one man fell, it fragmented itself into the unnumbered men of the world. We are the gods in disguise, not recognizing our brotherhood, not recognizing ourselves. Now we'll go to the beginning of Genesis and take it from there. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, he took from man a rib. And from that rib, he made a woman. And bringing a woman before man, man said at last, Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. For she was taken out of man. Therefore man must leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and they become one flesh. Now through the eyes of reason you discount it. It's all a myth. It's stupid. We know biologically that's stupid. And may I tell you it is true but not as the world sees it. To understand it you must have the vision. It must be revealed to you that man has no body distinct from his soul. That called body is only a portion of soul discerned by the five senses, the chief inlet of soul in this world. This body is Eve. This is my emanation, my vegetated mortal wife, my emanation, yet my wife till the sleep of death is over. This is Eve, whether it be male or female, makes no difference. This is my emanation, the Jerusalem in every individual man. I am a join to you and you to me by our emanated portion, which is the Jerusalem in every man. And this Jerusalem is the Jerusalem below that bears sons into slavery. Everyone comes in wrapped in this garment that is his emanated portion and he's enslaved in this world of eternal death. There's another Jerusalem. The one who emanates is the Jerusalem from above. And that is the emanation of the Lord. That is hidden from view. But it is one with this. This is my Eve. I become so much one with Eve that if you struck me tonight and caused me pain, I scream out, I am in pain. But what is his name by which all men must know him forever and forever? I am. Go to the people of Israel and tell them, I am has sent you. That's my name forever throughout all generations. So when you strike this, I am so much a part of my wife to which I have cleaved that strike her and you strike me. For I say I am in pain. I go on throughout. So take this from me. Destroy this temple and I will in three days raise it up again. They said, what? In three days? And it took us 46 years to build it. That's how the mind of man thinks. They think only in terms of an external thing made with human hands. Knowing not that he spoke of the temple of his body. For know ye not that ye are the temple of the Lord. And that the spirit of God dwells in you. That's what Paul asked us in his letter to the Corinthians. That we are actually, this is the temple. He dwells in his wife. He cleaves to her. And they become one. So this is the only Eve of Scripture. There never was another Eve. Every being born in this world, male or female, that is Eve. 
and the one who emanated it, that soul that emanated it, is the man spoken of. It's capitalized in the translation in Scripture, in the second chapter of Genesis. That she came out of man, and man is capitalized, generic man. So when I fell, I fell in one body, and falling in one body, I entered my cave. And I met my Savior in the grave. And some find a female garment there, and some a male woven with hair. So I found a male garment. My wife found a female garment. But she is neither female, and I am not male, we are man. For man in the resurrection is above the organization of sex. He is not a divided being, as we are told in Galatians. In Christ is neither male nor female, neither bond nor free, neither Greek nor Jew, neither black nor white. We are simply above the whole organization in this world of eternal death. So when Blake speaks to us in his greatest work, Jerusalem, he first states the theme. Having stated the theme, he tells it it's of the sleep of Alro. Well, the sleep of Alro refers to life in this world as we know it, right here in this world. And this world seems to be of an ultimate endless state. There is no end to it. It goes on and on. It also seems to us to have no purpose. For tonight, the richest man will die and leave it all behind him. And the poor man will die. He goes to the pauper's grave. But at the end, given the same length of time, both turn into dust and bones. And you will dig out one grave and find you can't tell who it is. It's all nothing. It seems to have no purpose. And yet man has to enter this world, regardless of what he seems to achieve in the world. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of the Lord. No matter how wise he seems to be, it is stupid in the eyes of God. And the strength of man is equal to the weakness of God. So let them strut across the stage and see all the things that they see, and it still is nothing. So it seems to be that here there is no end to futility. And there is no purpose. And yet man has to pass through it and awaken from it into eternal life. So he starts his theme and he lays the theme out. He's writing about this, of the sleep of Alra, and of the passage through eternal death and of the awakening to eternal life. Now he tells us this theme calls me night after night in sleep. And every morn awakes me at sunrise. Then I see the Savior over me, spreading his beams of love and dictating the words of this mild song. That's how he starts it. Now he starts the dictation. And he swears in his letter to his friend Butts that the whole thing came by immediate dictation. He said, I did not write it. I can brag about it. I can praise it. Because I dare not pretend to be anyone other than the secretary. The authors are in heaven. And it's the grandest poem that this world contains. For the spirit of truth dictated it. Morning after morning as he woke, it was dictating 12, sometimes 20, and sometimes 30 lines at a time. And what now seems to be the labor of a long life was produced without labor or study, and quite often against my will. But I had to take it down, and he would rise and take it down, and his wife Catherine would rise with him and sit in the silence while William recorded. And sometimes she'd hold his hand as he recorded because he was simply completely possessed by the Spirit as it wrote through him. And he's writing down this greatest of all poems, Jerusalem. <coughs> and this is how he starts. Awake. Awake, O sleeper of the land of shadows. <coughs> Wake. Ex 
pan. I am in you and you in me, mutual in love divine. <coughs> that being in whom we were contained, that being who fell deliberately for a purpose, to expand beyond its glory. Because only by this contraction into the state called death could it expand. We have that told in the story of the parable of the seed. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. Here we have, in this little story of the grain of wheat, it is set forth the mystery of life through death. If I want an extension of living, an extension of reality, an extension of existence, I must contract and die and empty myself of my glory, which I had with the Lord before that the world was. And entering into one body, one body falls. And the world tells it as a mistake. It's no mistake. It's a plan. God planned everything as it has come out and as it will be consummated. And in the end, when the mask comes off, after you awake, you are enhanced beyond your wildest dream by reason of the passage through death and your awakening to eternal life. And when we all awake, we are the ones who knew each other more intimately than anyone on earth could ever know. How could I ever know? My wife and I think the same thoughts through the day. This very, there isn't a day I'll voice something, she's been thinking about it. She voices something, I've been thinking about it. But no matter how intimate our thoughts are, in the sharing, it can compare to the intimacy that is ours. When these garments are taken off, and we are once more awakened into eternal life. So awake, O sleeper, well, you can't really awake by doing anything that you are taught to do. May I tell you? They'll tell you, don't eat meat, you'll awaken. Don't go to that church, you'll awaken. Don't do so and so, all the don'ts. You could do nothing and never awaken. You can do everything and not awaken. But may I tell you, that seems extravagant, and it is, because all will awaken. But not by any effort on their part while they're here. You will awaken at the moment in time that it was predetermined that you would awaken. Whether you'll be shining shoes at the time, or whether you'll be employing a million people. Our government today undoubtedly has on its payroll millions of people, and the one who is given credit is our president. He is the head. And so, in a technical sense, he employs a million. And tonight, the one shining his shoe could awaken, and he falls sound asleep and continue the dream. But he cannot die. That's the glorious part. This emanation, take it from me now, and in three days, I'll raise it up again. So this body of mine, shoot it, if you will, cut off its head. It's my emanation, and therefore I, believing myself to be it, I will find myself, in the immediate present, wearing the same body, only it'll be new. No parts will be missing, no bridge work, no fillings of my teeth, no gray hair, no need to wear glasses, and no need to wear any aid in this world. I will be a young man, 20 years old. Just as I snuff out this, and you call it dead, I'll be wearing a garment same as before. In a world terrestrial, just like this, and continue the journey until I awake. But I can tell you, I have awakened. And so when I take this off, whenever it is taken off, I will no longer be in this world. For this world does not terminate at the point where our senses cease to register. It. So when a man cannot follow those who are called dead, as he calls them dead, only because of his limitation, he can't follow it. But the one you call dead isn't dead to himself. He emanated the body that you knew, he emanates the same body. Same body, beautiful, enhanced beyond your wildest dreams, 
And he continues, not even knowing that he's gone through the door. Death is no more than leaving one room for another. In this same fabulous terrestrial world that is called in the mysteries, eternal death. And from which men will one day awaken into eternal life. But having descended 